stunning new evidence in the case of a Massachusetts man charged with murdering his missing wife, including Google searches like, quote, best ways to dispose body. The gruesome details we learned in Brian Walsh's arraignment as he pleads not guilty. A helicopter crash in Ukraine, killing at least a dozen people, including top leaders in Ukraine's interior ministry who were on board. A teacher dies hours after LAPD repeatedly shocked him with a taser during an arrest. I speak with Keenan Anderson's cousin, the co-founder of Black Lives Matter, about his life and their quest for answers. It's exhausting to think that for a decade, many of us have been doing this work and now it's on, at my own doorstep. Plus, backlash for new House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. The committee assignments he's handing out to scandal-plagued lawmakers and known election deniers. And a chilling view inside emotional abuse. Alice Darling shows us life through the eyes of a survivor. Tonight, star Anna Kendrick talks about the film, her own experiences, and how the movie can help others understand the isolation of abuse. If you do know someone who is going through it, that like just being there and accepting that there's nothing you can do, which is the hardest thing, might be the most valuable thing. Good evening, everyone. I'm Janae Norman, in for Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us on this Wednesday evening. We're tracking several developing stories tonight, including in North Carolina, where the FBI has been called to the scene after yet another power substation has been hit by gunfire. Aaron Katursky is standing by with the latest that we're learning at this hour. But first, we begin tonight with the gruesome new details that we're learning about the murder of Anna Walsh, a Massachusetts wife and mother of three who's been missing since New Year's Day. Her husband, Brian, was arraigned in a Massachusetts courtroom today on murder charges after prosecutors unveiled a massive amount of new evidence, including his chilling Google searches. Those searches said to include, have included things like 10 ways to dispose a dead body, how to stop a body from decomposing, and can you be charged with murder without a body? Stephanie Ramos leads us off tonight from Massachusetts. Do you understand those charges, Mr. Walsh? Tonight, prosecutors in Massachusetts unveiling the grisly internet searches they say Brian Walsh made after allegedly killing his wife, Anna, the mother of three young boys. At 4.55 a.m. on January 1st, he searched how long before a body starts to smell. According to authorities, Anna Walsh was last seen on January 1st. That morning, she failed to board a flight to Washington, D.C., where she worked, her phone still pinging near the couple's house. Brian Walsh did not report her missing until police knocked on his door days later. But prosecutors claim early on January 1st, Walsh, using his son's iPad, made several searches, including how to stop a body from decomposing, 10 ways to dispose of a dead body, if you really need to, how long for someone to be missing to inherit, and even how long does DNA last? And the day after... At 1.10 p.m., can you be charged with murder without a body? Prosecutors say Walsh, already under house arrest, awaiting sentencing for art fraud, also lied to police about his whereabouts, including a trip to this Home Depot on January 2nd, where he bought $450 worth of cleaning supplies. And over the next three days, multiple visits to dumpsters around the area, carrying garbage bags and other items. Most of that alleged evidence shredded and incinerated. By the time police located that, they were already destroyed. But authorities revealing today they did manage to find 10 trash bags with blood-stained items, including a hacksaw, towels, a purse, Anna's COVID vaccination card, and slippers, which they say had DNA from both Anna and Brian Walsh. And not one, but two knives and blood in the couple's basement. Tonight, Anna's friend, Pamela, calling her a super mom and high-power businesswoman who was private about her marriage. I always thought everything was okay. Now I'm starting to see a lot of dots connecting, which is highly unfortunate. Uh, unimaginable for her family and friends. And Stephanie Ramos joins us now from Massachusetts. And Stephanie, we're hearing from Brian's defense lawyers tonight. What are they saying? 
We are in a lengthy statement tonight. His lawyers saying in part, it is easy to charge a crime and even easier to say a person committed that crime. It is a much more difficult thing to prove it, which we will see if the prosecution can do. Now keep in mind, not guilty pleas were made on Brian Walsh's behalf to all of the charges, including murder and unlawfully handling of his wife's body. Janae. All right. Still so much to learn. Stephanie Ramos, thank you. And we head overseas now to the escalating war in Ukraine. Horrific images of a helicopter crash near the capital. One of the victims, Ukraine's interior minister, who is part of Zelensky's inner circle. The news coming as a major NATO official warns Russia is prepared for a long war. Our Matt Gutman continues our coverage in Ukraine tonight. Tonight, these images of the hellscape outside Kiev circulating online. The fiery wreckage after a government helicopter slammed into a residential building, a kindergarten nearby. Ignited jet fuel incinerating this courtyard at the crash site. Helicopter parts impaling this car. <laughs> Through the fires and the haze of smoke, you can hear the screams of the scared and the injured. At least 14 people killed, including one child. The emergency services helicopter smashing into the neighborhood at 8.20 a.m. at the time when children are typically dropped off at school. Here are images from inside the destroyed kindergarten, debris strewn across the nursery. At least 25 people injured, 11 of them children. The cause of the crash still unclear. Authorities say all nine aboard the helicopter headed to a, quote, war hotspot were killed. The entire leadership of Ukraine's interior department among the dead, including the minister himself, Denise Monastrisky, an advisor to Zelensky before the war. Tonight, addressing the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, President Zelensky calling those aboard the helicopter patriots, asking for a minute of silence. Zelensky then urging the West to move faster to arm Ukraine against Russia. Tragedies are outpacing life. The tyranny is outpacing the democracy. The supply of Ukraine with air defense systems must outpace Russia's next missile attacks. And Matt Gutman joins us now. Matt, what does Ukraine have to say about the crash and a possible cause? Janae, they're investigating all possibilities, right? It could be mechanical failure, pilot error, or some sort of sabotage from Russia. Now, we know it was foggy, so uh, pilot error is a possibility. It was foggy around Kiev this morning. We also know that an eyewitness told the Ukrainian national broadcaster that uh, she saw the helicopter spinning in the air and on fire before it crashed. And, of course, the Ukraine has already said that there is a possibility that it might be some sort of sabotage from the Russians. Again, everything on the table at at this point, Janae. Everything on the table. Matt Gutman there on the ground for us in Ukraine. Thanks, Matt. And back here at home tonight to Columbus, Ohio, where authorities have ruled the shooting death of 13-year-old Sinzay Reed a homicide. Reed was killed on January 6th while outside his apartment, and the alleged shooter, 36-year-old Craig Butler, remains free as police say he's claimed self-defense. Sinzay's mother, Megan Reed, wants to see Butler arrested. Columbus police tell ABC News the investigation is ongoing. Now to the failed GOP candidate for the New Mexico State House and the allegations that he hired hitmen to shoot at the homes of four Democratic officials. He appeared in court today, and we now know where he was on one of the most tumultuous days of our nation's history, January 6th. ABC's Mola Lange is in Albuquerque with the details. Tonight, Solomon Pena, the Republican candidate who lost his election in a landslide, appearing in court virtually, wearing a red jumpsuit, shackled, accused of orchestrating terrifying attacks targeting Democratic leaders in New Mexico. Late today, the judge ordering him to remain behind bars without bail. You will be held without bond until that hearing. The 39-year-old, who previously served nearly seven years in prison for felony theft, now being held on suspicion of multiple crimes, including shooting at an occupied dwelling, shooting from a motor vehicle, and conspiracy. Officials say Pena was an election denier, angry over his loss for a state house seat, hiring four hitmen to shoot at the homes of four state and county leaders, even pulling the trigger himself in one case. Bullets flying into state Senator Linda Lopez's home, right over her 10-year-old daughter's head while she was sleeping. It's very scary. As a mom, it's just it's something that you never want to experience. Officials say Pena wanted the hitmen to aim lower and shoot around 8 p.m. because the targets would more likely not be laying down, adding Pena wanted to cause serious injury or death. Fortunately, 
no one was hurt. Pena even showing up at the homes of his alleged targets, claiming the election was rigged. Hi, my name is Solomon Pena. On social media, Pena expressed support for Donald Trump, who also falsely claimed his 2020 election was rigged. Pena tweeting this picture of himself late last year, attending a January 6th event in Washington. And Mola Lange joins us now. Mola, what has the White House, have they said anything about this case? Well, yeah, Janae, they have. They weighed in tonight saying that the allegations against Pena are horrifying and shocking, that it's a miracle that no one was hurt in that string of shootings, uh, adding, quote, the nation rejects violence as a political tool. We should also note that Pena's attorney also weighed in tonight saying that the charges against him are merely accusations and that he is presumed innocent, Janae. All right, Mola, thank you for that update. Next to developing news tonight, the FBI has been called to the scene in North Carolina where yet another power substation has been hit by gunfire. This, the third one targeted. Senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky joins us now. And Aaron, what have you learned so far? This is an Energy United power substation, Janae, and it was near Thomasville, North Carolina. It was damaged by gunfire around 3 o'clock in the morning on Tuesday. The FBI is now investigating. There were no outages as a result of this damage, though. It serves customers near Greensboro, North Carolina, just southwest of there. There are no suspects, no motive. But authorities are working to determine whether there's any kind of a connection to attacks last month on two Duke Energy substations in Moore County. The entire county went dark as a result of that attack. No arrests there. The fear, though, Janae, is that the power grid is really becoming an attractive target for domestic violent extremists. They've called for attacks on electrical infrastructure as a way to challenge government authority. Janae? Good to hear that there were no outages in this case, Aaron, but still so concerning nonetheless. Aaron Kontursky, thank you. Thank you. To Washington now, where the new House Republican leadership has given committee assignments to New York Congressman George Santos. This despite growing evidence of his repeated lies about his background. And other Congress members who face scrutiny for their election denialism in past controversial comments have also secured key assignments, including Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, now set to serve on the Homeland Security Committee. Here's ABC's Chief of Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl. Yeah, go move to another country. Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene recently said that if she and Steve Bannon had organized the January 6th attack on the Capitol, quote, we would have won and it would have been armed, has been named to the powerful Homeland Security Committee by House Republican leaders. She later claimed her comment was a sarcastic joke. Q is a patriot. Shortly before being elected to Congress, Greene repeated conspiracy theories that the September 11th attack was an inside job by the U.S. government. It's odd there's never any evidence shown for a plane in the Pentagon. But Green has now become a strong ally of House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. She will also sit on the House Oversight Committee, which plans to heavily investigate the Biden administration and the Biden family. Joining her, three other Republicans who helped lead the effort to overturn the 2020 election. These are members who have promoted violent rhetoric and dangerous conspiracy theories. Congressman, what's your reaction? Also earning committee assignments from Republican leaders, serial liar George Santos, even as more of his lies come to light. Santos has claimed that his mother was in one of the towers of the World Trade Center when it was attacked on September 11th. Newly revealed documents today show that his mother wasn't even in the United United States on that day. Santos seems to have lied about his entire biography, including elaborate tales about his college education. You know, it's funny. I actually went to school on a, on a volleyball scholarship. And, you did? And wow. I did, yeah. Um, when I was in Baruch, we were the number one volleyball Did you graduate team, from Baruch? Uh, did you graduate from there? Yeah. So did I. I did, I did. Baruch College says he never even attended the school. Santos also faces charges of check fraud in Brazil and has ties to a company accused of operating a Ponzi scheme. Still, Republicans chose to put him on the Small Business Committee. In this country, you're innocent until proven guilty, so mm -hmm. we're going to uh, treat him like any other member and you know, keep an eye on it. And John Carl joins me now. John, I want to go back to those controversial members who secured seats on the Oversight Committee. Just explain the importance of that committee itself, especially in this new Congress, and how those members could influence the investigations that they'll pursue. Oh, look, this is a really high-profile committee. It's, it's the lead 
uh, committee conducting investigations in the House, and the House Republicans, as they've taken over the Congress, have made it clear that investigating Joe Biden, investigating his administration, investigating his family uh, will be front and center in terms of their agenda. So the, those members will be on that committee, a committee that has subpoena power uh, and clearly uh, a, a, an ability to influence the course of those investigations. So it's not a minor committee. It's not a low profile committee. It's a pretty big deal. And we will certainly see how that shakes out. John Carl, thank you so much. Thank you, Janae. Well, tonight the FAA is investigating after a JetBlue flight departing from JFK en route to Puerto Rico was delayed today because it struck another parked JetBlue plane. The airline says early this morning the flight came into light contact with an unoccupied aircraft during pushback. No one was hurt, they say, and the flight was brought back to the gate. Again, the FAA says they will investigate that incident. And in Alaska, a mother and her one-year-old son were killed by a polar bear. Reports say the bear entered the remote village of Wales in far west Alaska, just 55 miles from Russia. It began chasing residents before it was shot and killed as it attacked the two victims. Experts say decreasing ice levels have made polar bear encounters more common, but they rarely attack and kill humans. Well, now to the mysterious death of an American celebrating his first wedding anniversary in Mexico. Following an apparent fall from a balcony at a resort, authorities say it was an accident, but his family believes he was the victim of a brutal crime. The family of an American public defender who died while celebrating his first wedding anniversary at a Mexican resort is demanding answers, saying they believe he was the victim of a crime. Elliot Blair and Kimberly Williams staying at Las Rocas Resort and Spa last weekend, which advertises its property online as the best choice south of the border, located 15 minutes south of Tijuana. Authorities confirming the day before the couple's anniversary, Blair was found dead from an apparent fall from a third floor balcony. An autopsy by Mexican officials ruling the fall caused his death, calling the tragedy an unfortunate accident. But earlier that day, a local law enforcement official pointing to a specific injury on Blair's forehead, telling ABC News the wound would not have been caused by a fall. Now, Blair's wife, who's also a public defender, hiring a private investigator, telling ABC News, based on their initial investigation, Elliot was the victim of a brutal crime. She goes on to say the incident did not occur off their room's private balcony, nor any balcony, but instead in an open-air walkway outside the front door of their room, and that her husband was found in his underwear, his sleeping T-shirt and socks. The Mexican authorities are currently investigating the case and they've released almost no information at all. This is also uh, a very dangerous part of the world. It's important that everybody just keep an open mind and hopefully the, uh, the Mexican authorities will have more information for us. The U.S. State Department confirming they are aware of the death and stand ready to provide assistance. As family and friends now search for answers, Blair is being remembered as a zealous advocate for justice. He was such a wonderful human being and such a compassionate, caring, competent attorney. His diligence but what, and his courtroom demeanor was fantastic. So he just, I really saw excellent young attorney who fought hard for his clients and gave them their best ethical defense. And tonight we are tracking a massive cross-country storm. 30 states on high alert for heavy snow, high winds, and possible tornadoes. Take a look at this major pileup on Interstate 70 in Colorado. The state police there say up to 60 semi-trucks are stuck there on the road because of the weather. The storm set to reach the east tomorrow. Senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is timing it all out. Hey, Rob. Hi, Janae. As we've seen on I-70, the cold side of the system certainly have the biggest impacts today here in Steamboat Springs, Colorado, over a foot of snow falling. But the biggest threat as far as life-threatening conditions right now is in Louisiana and Mississippi. That's where tornado watch is up until 8 o'clock. So far, we've only seen some wind damage with this uh, line of storms, but uh, the next couple of hours could be dicey, especially across southern Louisiana there near uh, Lake Charles and I-10. But the winter storm warnings, look at them, across eastern Colorado all the way to the UP of Michigan, and now winter storm watches have been posted for a big chunk of the northeast as this thing is moving very quickly. The center is over Kansas right now. It's in strengthening mode. 
6 to 12 inches of additional snowfall expected across parts of the upper Midwest and rain moving into Chicago tonight, then through Ohio in the morning. The morning rush for Pittsburgh looks to be wet uh, but messy, and the snows continue to push into uh, parts of upstate New York, and the heavy rain quickly into the I-95 corridor, including Manhattan and much of southern New England for tomorrow's evening rush, and then into the, through the day on Friday, there will be snow on the ground and snow still coming down pretty much all day long for parts of New England before this coast-to-coast -coast system finally hits the Atlantic. Janae? So many states on high alert. Rob, we appreciate you. Stay warm out there. And when we come back, an unlikely pursuit. A suspect takes an allegedly stolen tractor on a wild police chase. Plus, a dramatic 911 call from the moments just after actor Jeremy Renner was run over by a snowplow. Someone's in front of my house on the ground. They got run over by a snowcat. He's been crushed. Okay, we is a neighbor's desperate call for help in the moments right after. But first, the investigation into the death of a 31-year-old teacher who died hours after being tased by police. His cousin, Black Lives Matter co-founder Patrice Cullors, joined us to discuss whether her family plans to take any legal action and the answers they're now demanding from police. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. Bring your friends. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. It's so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. At a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Ready for a good show? I'm Phil Gucci. The fireworks by Gucci. No matter how big, no matter how small, it is dangerous. It's not a paycheck. <laughs> it's our life. And today, the Department of Justice and FBI announced they're opening a civil rights investigation into the police-involved death of Tyree Nichols in Memphis. Nichols, who is just 29 years old, is just another case of a young black man dying at the hands of police during a traffic stop. Which also leads us to another case we've been reporting on, the death of Keenan Anderson. Keenan Anderson was a 31-year-old teacher visiting L.A. when he was stopped by an LAPD motorcycle officer and was accused of causing a traffic accident and then trying to steal a car. Police tased him several times and he died hours later. Now there are growing calls for answers over his death. And joining us now is his cousin, artist, activist, and Black Lives Matter co-founder Patrice Cullors and her attorney who is also representing the family, Carl Douglas. Thank you to you both for being with us. Um, and Patrice, I just want to extend our condolences for your family's loss. Um, obviously, just unimaginable what you're going through right now. But if you can, just start off telling us where the investigation stands right now. 
Well, right now, LAPD is investigating the incident that happened with my cousin. Um, and that's all I really know. And, you know, when you say it like that, that LAPD is investigating this incident with your cousin that obviously happened with LAPD, tell me, tell me your thoughts on that alone. Um, uh, it's troubling that the police department, who is often at the hands of killing black people, are the same department that is the first department to investigate these kinds of issues. And I think... You know, our family is waiting for that investigation to end so that it can hit the desk of the district attorney, George Gascon. And uh, for LAPD, I know it, uh, an, a column in the LA Times said that your cousin was one of three men who died this month by what they called unnecessary violence with LAPD. Can you just take us back a few days and give us the timeline of why Keenan was in LA and how everything led up to that day? Um, he was visiting friends and family um, when he came to L.A. He had just started working at uh, high school as a 10th grade English teacher in D.C. Um, I didn't find out the news about his death until January 5th. Um, but I didn't find out why he died until January 6th when I received a um, news article from my cousin who said Keenan was killed by the police. And and what what immediately, if you can, what immediately went through your mind then? Um, I was in shock. Um, I think for black people, we don't ever want to die at the hands of law enforcement, but we all prepare ourselves for the day that the, that it may happen. Um, but nothing prepares you for your loved one or family member to die a violent death and the way that he did. And I think um, I'm still processing. I'm still really processing what, what happened to him. Carl, I want to bring you in. A coroner's investigation is underway to determine whether it was the taser or the drugs that caused Keenan's death. And in the meantime, LAPD released a toxicology report. They claim that cocaine and marijuana were found in Keenan's blood. Do you believe that to be true? And what do you make of the release of this toxicology report? Janae, I have been involved for almost 42 years representing families who have been victimized by police conduct. And it is so regrettable that there's a routine that always comes in where they try to make an effort to dehumanize the person who died. In this case, it is certainly clear that a substantial factor causing Mr. Anderson's death was not the presence of any drugs in his system, but it was the decision by trained killers to taser Mr. Anderson at least six times. Has the family made a decision about filing a lawsuit? We have. In days, there will be the filing of what's called a claim for damages. That is the first document that we have to file to put the city on notice that there will, in fact, be a lawsuit coming. The city will have 45 days to either accept that claim or to reject it. And a rejection is expected. Once that is rejected, there will be a lawsuit filed on behalf of the five-year-old son of this man who died in vain, who should not have died. How, how are you handling all of that? It's a lot. It's a lot. Um, today I feel particularly uh, weepy. I'm not sure why, maybe because I have a stress cold from doing a lot of work this week, but... Um, it's exhausting to think that for a decade, many of us have been doing this work and now it's on, at my own doorstep. Um, and I feel like it's surreal still um, because I'm not just grieving, my whole family is. And we're all trying to make sense of this moment. And Patrice, uh, to, to hear you say that, that this is this, I know you've said in other interviews that this nightmare is now the reality you and your family are living. And so, again, we extend our condolences to you and your family. Uh, and Patrice, thank you. Thank you. Carl, 
Douglas, thank you both for being with us tonight. Thank you. And still to come here on Prime tonight, how scientists picked up a radio signal that's more than 8 billion years old. Plus, inside the mind of a woman suffering from emotional abuse, actress Anna Kendrick tells us how she pulled from her own personal experience for this chilling new film. And uncertainty about the future is leading to layoffs in the tech world. We take a closer look at what's fueling these fears by the numbers. So much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Grammy-winning artist Megan Thee Stallion. Megan was a victim of a crime. The woman was shot, wound up in the hospital. Rapper accused of shooting Megan Thee Stallion. Tory Lanez is accused of shooting her after a night out. Megan Thee Stallion and the trial of Tory Lanez. There were times that she wished that he had just killed her so she wouldn't have to have gone through what she went through in the last two years. This is Impact by Nightline. Stay strong, Megan. Thank you. Meg, how do you feel? Now streaming only on Hulu. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Paul. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay! He's like the Justin Bieber of the <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Shut out. It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Paul. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Net Geo Wild. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. He may not look like central casting for a movie star hero, but what he did and how he risked it all to save hundreds of lives from terror are what heroes are made of. Really? That guy? What's the life and death truth behind what he did? Truth and Lies, The Informant. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Capitol Hill, I'm Rachel Scott. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Layoffs are coming fast and furious at the nation's tech companies amid fears of a looming recession. So let's take a look by the numbers. Microsoft announced today it would lay off 10,000 employees or about 5% of the company's headcount as the software giant races for slower growth as companies spend less on their IT spending. And the online retail behemoth Amazon today began the process of eliminating more than 18,000 employees. That's the largest reduction in the company's 20 year history and it comes after Amazon's workforce ballooned to more than 1.6 million employees during the pandemic doubling the company's headcount from the end of 2019 but Amazon and Microsoft are just the latest to lower the axe with CNBC reporting that some 60,000 employees have been let go by tech companies in just the past year and among them software services company Salesforce said it would cut 7,000 jobs earlier this month or about 10 percent of its workforce. In November, Facebook parent company Meta slashed its workforce by 11,000 jobs or about 13% of its staff as losses pile up from the social media company's transition to focus on the metaverse. And Twitter, of course, cut some 3,700 jobs after Elon Musk took over this fall, or that was about half the company's staff. More workers have quit in response to Musk's takeover. As the new CEO says the company was reportedly losing $4 million 
billion dollars per day. But while some tech companies say they're hurting, it's worth noting that corporate profits hit a record high of $2.08 trillion in the third quarter of 2022. That's according to the Commerce Department. As higher inflation across many sectors drove revenue growth, critics say companies pass on the costs to consumers. And we still have a ton to get to here on Prime tonight. The latest on Damar Hamlin's involvement with his team as he recovers from cardiac arrest. And from Miley Cyrus to Shakira, why revenge anthems are topping the charts right now. And how a horror movie about a robotic doll turned into a social media obsession. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. much happening these days it's hard to keep up things change hour by hour minute by minute the historic weather that's now unfolding the worries on wall street we're bringing you the right now been a nationwide teacher shortage the right now look at the day ahead an alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories world news now and america this morning america's number one early morning news today does feel a little different early mornings on abc news live This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're making magic. Grammy-winning artist Megan Thee Stallion. Megan was the victim of a crime. The woman was shot, wound up in the hospital. Rapper accused of shooting Megan Thee Stallion. Tori Lanez is accused of shooting her after a night out. Megan Thee Stallion and the trial of Tori Lanez. There were times that she wished that he had just killed her so she wouldn't have to have gone through what she went through in the last two years. This is Impact by Nightline. Stay strong, Megan. Thank you. Meg, how do you feel? Now streaming only on Hulu. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The Hunt. True crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis wants to ban all forms of COVID-19 mandates permanently. The governor announced a new legislative proposal that would prohibit vaccine passports as well as vaccine and mask requirements at all Florida schools and businesses. It would also prevent employers from hiring or firing anyone based on vaccination status. DeSantis had signed legislation putting these current bans in place during a special legislative session in 2021. They are currently set to expire in June. A Russian national arrested and charged in what the Justice Department describes as a money laundering operation using a cryptocurrency exchange. Officials said Anatoly Legodimov, the founder and majority owner of the crypto exchange, Bitslotto, was taken into custody in Miami. Bitslotto allegedly did not have appropriate anti-money laundering safeguards, and officials said it became a haven for criminal proceeds and funds intended for use in crimes. The Justice Department said users of a former long running darknet marketplace exchanged more than $700 million in cryptocurrency with Bitslotto. Legademo is charged with conducting an unlicensed money transmitting business. 
Police in North Carolina found themselves chasing after a suspect on a John Deere tractor. Video shows patrol vehicles chasing after the tractor in Watauga County. Police said the suspect allegedly stole the tractor and drove it recklessly on a highway, crashing it into multiple vehicles. Police eventually used stop sticks and shot out a rear tire to slow down the tractor, after which the suspect jumped off the tractor wielding a knife before eventually being taken into custody. Police said no one was injured throughout the incident. Someone's in front of my house on the ground. They got run over by a snow cat. He's been crushed. New 911 audio reveals the harrowing moments after actor Jeremy Renner was severely injured on New Year's Day. A neighbor is heard describing the injuries Renner suffered and asking for medical help. Through it all, the actor is heard in pain in the background. Okay, he says he's got ribs issues. Okay. Uh, his ribs look like they may be crushed. He's got a head wound as well. The actor was eventually taken to the hospital with life-threatening injuries and needed multiple surgeries. He has since returned home. DeMar Hamlin's road to recovery has reached the Buffalo Bills facility. Head coach Sean McDermott said the safety, who suffered a cardiac arrest in the middle of the team's January 2nd game against the Cincinnati Bengals, has been at the facility almost daily with limited involvement with the team. He comes in and, and really just started really today or yesterday and just trying to get back to a little bit of a routine and, um, and just getting himself acclimated again and taking a a one step up, you know, baby step at a time here. McDermott said Hamlin has not been in team meetings yet. He was not at the Bills playoff win over the Dolphins, and it's not yet known if he'll attend the divisional round game against the Bengals. A radio signal from a galaxy far, far away and from a long, long time ago. Researchers from Canada and India say they've detected a faint signal emitted from a galaxy when the universe was only 4.9 billion years old, making the source a staggering 8.8 .8 billion years old. It's the first time a radio signal of this kind has been detected at such a long distance. The detection was made possible through a process of gravitational lensing. The discovery is set to open up the possibility of learning more about the evolution of stars and galaxies with existing telescopes. At the core of Alice Darling is a tale of emotional abuse, the anxiety, the isolation, the uncertainty in a movie that uses limited dialogue to bring us inside the mind of a woman living in fear of her own partner. That woman is played by actress Anna Kendrick, who recently revealed that she's lived through her own experience with emotional abuse. Kendrick sat down with our Mona Kosar Abdi to open up about her chilling new movie and the hopes she hopes it brings to survivors. Alice, darling. I lied to him. He has every right to be angry. Lied? About what? About being here. That's my girl. Anna Kendrick, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Of course. I'm really excited to talk about your powerful drama, Alice Darling. And you play Alice, who is dealing with the effects of being in this psychologically abusive relationship with a boyfriend who is manipulative. He isolates her, and he convinces her that her friends are bad for her. This movie, you say, was shot in under a month. What boundaries did you have to create playing a character that herself doesn't feel safe? Yeah, I mean, I felt really fortunate to be surrounded by people who came to this film because they related very deeply to the experience of being in and around psychological abuse. And I think sometimes that's all you need to be like, okay, I'm, I'm not gonna get overwhelmed. I'm actually gonna be okay because I'm surrounded by people who make me feel really safe. That support is very important. And I noticed that there's actually limited dialogue in this movie, particularly between Alice and Simon. Yeah. Why is that important to show that kind of vulnerability, to pay attention to her body language? For a movie that is about a, an emotionally abusive relationship, it really stays with Alice's experience because sometimes if we're in a situation like that, we tend to get lost in cataloging, like, well, they said this and they did this and was that wrong or wasn't that wrong? And the thing that's more important is like, what's happening to me? How do I feel? And listening to that can be so hard because I, I think, you know, culturally we're sort of conditioned to not listen to ourselves and to just sort of logic our way out of things. And I thought it was just such a beautiful and brave choice to um, just stay with this woman and watch her. And it's almost like daring the audience to say, like, you know, tell me she's not being abused. Uh, I'm trying to look out why you would choose to hurt me I so deliberately. No, I, I mean, I just wanted to hang out with my friends. Right, 
I wasn't. So you wouldn't be here with them at my expense? You yourself admitted that you were a survivor of abuse. What was important for you to portray through Alice? It was important to me to have the movie live in that uncertain space because that's the experience when you're going through it is kind of playing mind games with yourself. And, you know, a lot of people have told me that, like, halfway through the movie, they're not sure if Alice is making it up. And I actually think that's kind of great because it really helps illuminate what the experience is inside of a person who's going through it because you aren't sure if you're making it up. <laughs> Alice. Please, please go away. Please go away. Please go away. In the beginning, she was kind of justifying what he was saying to her about even something as small as like the sugar. Sugar is bad for you. But you see how those are elements of how he was being manipulating her, for example. Yeah, I love that little through line about the sugar because it's a perfectly fair thing for someone to say sugar is not good for your body. Sugar is not healthy. But uh, then you have to kind of pull apart, like, why are you saying that to me? And, like, it sort of invites the audience to trust this woman who, by the way, is not doing very well. Alice. I can't do another thing wrong. Alice, what does that even mean? No, I lied to him. He doesn't even know that I'm here. What? I mean, he does now. He called. Well, why did you lie to him? Because I'm bad. What? And there's actually a few lines that she kept repeating. What are the chances that I don't come out on the other side? What are the chances that I don't want to? Where will you put your shame? Why do you think survivors tend to question their own experience? I mean, I can't, you know, speak to anybody, <laughs> anybody's experience but my own, but I would get trapped in those kind of loops of, um, of trying to just figure it out. I never really knew what I even meant by that, but my brain was just working overtime because I just had the sense that if I could just be a little bit better and if I could just read one more book on communication or something, things would turn around. And it's really difficult to um, give up that control and just grieve and like get out. For me, that really resonated because it was so common for me to get trapped in a, a loop of um, this very false sense that if I just went over everything one more time, I, I could figure out how to make everything okay and how to get safe. And that justification is also why uh, survivors of abuse are likely to go back to their situations, to go back to their abusers. And there's a line in the movie where Simon says, I give it a week. Mm. What do you hope that people who are in similar situations or have dealt with similar situations get out of this movie? The most that I can hope for is that it's a drop in the bucket of questioning and beginning to get curious about what might be happening to them or to a friend. I think that one thing that might be um, actionable is the sense that if you do know someone who is going through it, that like just being there and accepting that there's nothing you can do, which is the hardest thing, might be the most valuable thing. Definitely. And on the other side, what message do you hope that it sends to perpetrators of abuse? The hardest thing for people in these kinds of relationships is that I think that the inner experience of the victim and the perpetrator are remarkably similar. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are perpetrators who likely come out of it feeling like they were um, victimized, which I think we all deserve to kind of stay curious about that and heal from whatever is creating potentially bad behavior in us. People know you for movies such as Pitch Perfect. I got my ticket for the long way round. And you play more lighthearted roles. I had a thing the other day where I was walking past a window and I caught my reflection and I swear to God, I was like, who's that lady? Ugh. Like, who's this grown woman? Yeah. Why was it important for you to play Alice at this time in your career? The fact that the subject matter was so close to home was uh, something even more potentially rewarding but also scary. I wanted to kind of see what would happen if I put all of that down and like, put down all the armor. It was, yeah, personally very rewarding to do that. Anna Kendrick, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it and appreciate you sharing your experience as well. Thank you so much for having me.
And thank you so much to Mona for bringing us that story. And you can watch Alice Darling exclusively in AMC theaters nationwide starting this Friday, January 20th. It is the new horror movie that's become a social media obsession. Megan is about a robotic doll and it's both thrilling and terrifying viewers and fans already want a sequel. So why is this becoming such a sensation? Our Stephanie Ramos explains. Meet Megan. It's nice to meet you, Katie. Do you want to hang out? Okay. She's the unsettling star of the new horror comedy movie that shares her name. Eat the toppings, Katie. Research shows if you force a child to eat vegetables, they'll be less likely to choose those foods as adults. Is that so? Yes. Experts say... Megan, turn off. ...about a robotic doll designed to be a child's best friend. I thought we were having a conversation. Until she isn't. You're just a stupid rubber doll with fake hair. Ow! Let go! You need to learn some manners, Brandon. <laughs> Producer Jason Blum from hits like Get Out. Get out! Yo! <laughs> and producer James Wan. Wanna play a game? No stranger to deadly dolls like Jigsaw from his Saw franchise. <laughs> and Annabelle from the universe of The Conjuring. What do you need? Your soul. Megan has been a surprise hit, a viral sensation that has earned more than $94 million worldwide at the box office in just 10 days, with rave reviews for its human star, Allison Williams, and that campy, uncanny doll of a villain. Megan isn't a CGI creation. Under her mask is Amy Donald, the 12-year-old child actress who's creeping out adult audiences in her film debut. You killed people. Oh, big whoop. You seem to be a very nice young lady, but you're playing a murderous doll that is people. <laughs> Was that weird to you? It's new, it's exciting, it's fun. A little bit crazy, a little bit creepy. Megan. But it's so worth it. Did you hurt someone? God, I hope not. Because if I did, we'd both be in a lot of trouble. Director Gerard Johnstone shot the film on location in New Zealand, casting Amy locally to embody the murderous Megan. This is the part where you run. Amy had only ever been in um, a featured extra on a TV show before, um, and but she was a national dance champion, and she had a brown belt in karate, and she was a contortionist. But what impressed us most of all was she was actually a really incredible little actress. You know something, Gemma? You're exhausting. Amy is a trained dancer and gymnast, skills perfect for creating Megan's creepy, almost lifelike movements. So with one eerie, over-the-top dance scene going viral on social media, spawning parodies. So some of the ballet videos that are out there have gone viral. Did you expect that at all? No, I really did not. Because one day, mom woke me up and was like, Amy, you've got to see this. And there was just tons of videos. And it was crazy. <laughs> that blank stare, doll's outfit, and strange dance have been splashed all over social media, encouraged by the filmmakers with viral marketing videos at movie theaters in New York City, even at an NFL game. She's sort of this global icon right now, this image, Megan, that you see everywhere. You see her on billboards all over LA. But she's also iconic in that she's serving. I think really it's that she's sort of modeling all the time. You know, she has this, this really captivating face. Have I done something to upset you, Gemma? No, of course not. And yet your demeanor indicates that I have. So in a way, you know, she's she's serving this model look and she's also doing this really subtle acting, you know, and I think that's what's captivating people. It's like, who is this this it girl right now? You know, she's she's really the talk of the town. The film offering a sinister take on how companionship devices can be utterly engrossing for young kids. How did this movie, Megan, come about for you? 
Well, I was a, a, a relatively new dad, like really struggling with how to balance technology and you know how suddenly kids just had devices and parents are just handing out devices to the kids and i get it it's like it's so hard to keep a child entertained and there was a really clear allegory in this just about you know parenting in the 21st century which is why i kind of leaped at it wash your hands roll up your sleeves great job and just like Megan herself, there's always room for an update. So there are talks of a Megan sequel. Would you like to return to the character? 100%. I think a Megan 2 would be amazing. I'd love to do a sequel. It seems that the people have spoken and they would like to see, um, you know, another Megan. I have more I want to say. I know that Megan has more that she wants to say. So yeah, I can't wait. For teens and adults alike, there's no doubt Megan has an appeal, as long as we stay on her good side. What do your friends think about all of this? They think it's absolutely crazy. Um, they're really excited to watch the movie, and they sent me a message the other day saying, do you want to come watch it with us because we're a little bit scared? <laughs> <laughs> Our thanks to Stephanie for that. Now to the rise of the revenge anthem. Superstars from Miley Cyrus to Shakira have fans fishing for clues on the inspirations behind their newest hits. ABC's Chris Connolly has the details. Revenge, it's said, means digging two graves, one for your enemy and one for yourself. But we were right till we weren't built a home and watched it burn. In her new video for Flowers, Miley Cyrus is alive and whoa. Target of her self-reliant vengeance? Well, that's a topic of considerable speculation. Fans noting Miley's song dropped on her ex-husband Liam Hemsworth's 33rd birthday. Probably just a coincidence, don't you think? Miley's not the only pop music icon in 2023 deploying a hit song to settle a score. Sorry, baby, I said, in the Spanish language track Berserk Music Session number 53, Shakira is going scorched earth on her retired soccer star ex, Gerald Piquet, with such aimed like an arrow lyrics as, a she-wolf like me isn't for guys like you. <laughs> So revenge songs are nothing new. The breakup songs that are a little more petty, a little more pointed, a little more angry. Who doesn't enjoy a good revenge track? Like Beyonce's Irreplaceable. Don't you ever for a second get to Irreplaceable. Or in the hands of Pop's 21st century Avenger incarnate Taylor Swift. It can be a 10-minute magnum opus that's still stirring, so who is he chatter? And where, just like Miley, living well is the best revenge. It certainly is, they say. Well, before we go tonight, the image of the day. Maryland's new governor, Wes Moore, you see him right there, taking the oath of office in what is absolutely an historic inauguration. Moore becoming Maryland's first black governor and only the third to be elected in the nation's history. That is our show for this hour. Please stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thank you for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, we're staying on top of a few different stories. The officer convicted of killing George Floyd is challenging that decision. Why his attorney says it should be overturned. Plus, the rare form of cancer a woman claims she got after a trip to the nail salon. And why Taylor Swift and Ticketmaster are back in the headlines. Stick around. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust, and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news.
after an extraordinary newsmaking year. Thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We're honored. ABC's 2020 winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're baby. making magic. I'm Janae Norman. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We are monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. Authorities in Columbus, Ohio, have ruled the shooting death of 13-year-old Sinzay Reed a homicide. Reed was killed on January 6th while outside his apartment. And the alleged shooter, 36-year-old Craig Butler, remains free as police say he's claimed self-defense. Sinzay's mother, Megan Reed, wants to see Butler arrested. Columbus police tell ABC News the investigation is ongoing. The attorney for former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin argued the state should throw out his state murder conviction. He argued that pretrial publicity, ongoing civil unrest, alleged exclusion of evidence and misconduct from the prosecution led to an unfair trial. Chauvin was sentenced to 22 and a half years in prison. The court has 90 days to make a decision on the appeal. The Senate Judiciary has just announced a January 24th hearing on the lack of competition in the live venue ticketing industry. This, of course, following that disastrous ticketing debacle around the Taylor Swift concert back in November. No witnesses have been announced just yet, but this is a panel that typically reaches for the top of industries. Senator Amy Klobuchar has argued that Live Nation and Ticketmaster should be broken up if misconduct is found. We do head overseas now to the escalating war in Ukraine. Horrific images of a helicopter crash near the capital. One of the victims, Ukraine's interior minister, who was part of Zelensky's inner circle. The news coming as a major NATO official warns Russia is prepared for a long war. Our Matt Gutman continues our coverage in Ukraine for tonight. Tonight, these images of the hellscape outside Kiev circulating online. The fiery wreckage after a government helicopter slammed into a residential building, a kindergarten nearby. Ignited jet fuel incinerating this courtyard at the crash site. Helicopter parts impaling this car. <laughs> Through the fires and the haze of smoke, you can hear the screams of the scared and the injured. At least 14 people killed, including one child. The emergency services helicopter smashing into the neighborhood at 8.20 a.m. at the time when children are typically dropped off at school. Here, images from inside the destroyed kindergarten, debris strewn across the nursery. At least 25 people injured, 11 of them children. The cause of the crash, still unclear. Authorities say all nine aboard the helicopter headed to a, quote, war hotspot were killed. The entire leadership of Ukraine's interior department among the dead, including the minister himself, Denis Monastrisky, an advisor to Zelensky before the war. Tonight, addressing the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, President Zelensky calling those aboard the helicopter patriots, asking for a minute of silence. Zelensky then urging the West to move faster to arm Ukraine against Russia. Tragedies are outpacing life. The tyranny is outpacing the democracy. The supply of Ukraine with air defense systems must outpace Russia's next missile attacks. 
Our thanks to our Mac Upman there in Ukraine. Back here at home now to chilling new details in the case of the Massachusetts man charged with murdering his missing wife. Anna Walsh, a mother of three, has been missing since New Year's Day. Her husband, Brian Walsh, was arraigned today. Prosecutors revealing evidence, including Google searches like 10 ways to dispose of a dead body. Our Stephanie Ramos was in court and joins us with the latest. Do you understand the charges, Mr. Walsh? Tonight, prosecutors in Massachusetts unveiling the grisly internet searches they say Brian Walsh made after allegedly killing his wife, Anna, the mother of three young boys. At 4.55 a.m. on January 1st, he searched how long before a body starts to smell. According to authorities, Anna Walsh was last seen on January 1st. That morning, she failed to board a flight to Washington, D.C., where she worked, her phone still pinging near the couple's house. Brian Walsh did not report her missing until police knocked on his door days later. But prosecutors claim early on January 1st, Walsh, using his son's iPad, made several searches, including how to stop a body from decomposing, 10 ways to dispose of a dead body, if you really need to, how long for someone to be missing to inherit, and even how long does DNA last? And the day after... At 1.10 p.m., can you be charged with murder without a body? Prosecutors say Walsh, already under house arrest, awaiting sentencing for art fraud, also lied to police about his whereabouts, including a trip to this Home Depot on January 2nd, where he bought $450 worth of cleaning supplies. And over the next three days, multiple visits to dumpsters around the area, carrying garbage bags and other items. Most of that alleged evidence shredded and incinerated. By the time police located that, they were already destroyed. But authorities revealing today they did manage to find 10 trash bags with blood-stained items, including a hacksaw, towels, a purse, Anna's COVID vaccination card, and slippers, which they say had DNA from both Anna and Brian Walsh. And not one, but two knives and blood in the couple's basement. Tonight, Anna's friend, Pamela, calling her a super mom and high-power businesswoman who was private about her marriage. I always thought everything was okay. Now I'm starting to see a lot of dots connecting, which is highly unfortunate. And our thanks to Stephanie for that update. Well, turning now to the failed GOP candidate for the New Mexico State House and the allegations that he hired hitmen to shoot at the homes of four Democratic officials. He appeared in court today, and we now know where he was on one of the most tumultuous days of our nation's history, January 6th. ABC's Mola Lange is in Albuquerque with the details. Tonight, Solomon Pena, the Republican candidate who lost his election in a landslide, appearing in court virtually, wearing a red jumpsuit, shackled, accused of orchestrating terrifying attacks targeting Democratic leaders in New Mexico. Late today, the judge ordering him to remain behind bars without bail. You will be held without bond until that hearing. The 39-year-old, who previously served nearly seven years in prison for felony theft, now being held on suspicion of multiple crimes, including shooting at an occupied dwelling, shooting from a motor vehicle, and conspiracy. Officials say Pena was an election denier, angry over his loss for a state house seat, hiring four hitmen to shoot at the homes of four state and county leaders, even pulling the trigger himself in one case. Bullets flying into State Senator Linda Lopez's home, right over her 10-year-old daughter's head while she was sleeping. It's very scary. As a mom, it's just it's something that you never want to experience. Officials say Pena wanted the hitmen to aim lower and shoot around 8 p.m. because the targets would more likely not be laying down, adding Pena wanted to cause serious injury or death. Fortunately, no one was hurt. Pena even showing up at the homes of his alleged targets, claiming the election was rigged. Hi, my name is Solomon Pena. On social media, Pena expressed support for Donald Trump, who also falsely claimed his 2020 election was rigged. Pena tweeting this picture of himself late last year, attending a January 6th event in Washington. 
Our thanks to Mola Lange. Turning to politics and Washington now, where the new House Republican leadership has given committee assignments to New York Congressman George Santos. This just by growing evidence of his repeated lies about his background. And other Congress members who've also faced scrutiny for their election denialism and past controversial comments have also secured key assignments, including Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, now set to serve on the Homeland Security Committee. Here's ABC's Chief Washington Correspondent, Jonathan and Carl. Yeah, go move to another Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene recently said that if she and Steve Bannon had organized the January 6th attack on the Capitol, quote, we would have won and it would have been armed, has been named to the powerful Homeland Security Committee by House Republican leaders. She later claimed her comment was a sarcastic joke. Q is a patriot. Shortly before being elected to Congress, Greene repeated conspiracy theories that the September 11th attack was an inside job by the U.S. government. It's odd. There's never any evidence shown for a plane in the Pentagon. But Green has now become a strong ally of House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. She will also sit on the House Oversight Committee, which plans to heavily investigate the Biden administration and the Biden family. Joining her, three other Republicans who helped lead the effort to overturn the 2020 election. These are members who have promoted violent rhetoric and dangerous conspiracy theories. Congressman, what's your reaction? Also earning committee assignments from Republican leaders, serial liar George Santos, even as more of his lies come to light. Santos has claimed that his mother was in one of the towers of the World Trade Center when it was attacked on September 11th. Newly revealed documents today show that his mother wasn't even in the United United States on that day. Santos seems to have lied about his entire biography, including elaborate tales about his college education. You know, it's funny. I actually went to school on a, on a volleyball scholarship. You and, did? And wow. I did, yeah. Um, when I was in Baruch, we were the number one volleyball Did you graduate team, from Baruch? Uh, did you graduate from there? Yeah. So did I. I did, I did. Baruch College says he never even attended the school. Santos also faces charges of check fraud in Brazil and has ties to a company accused of operating a Ponzi scheme. Still, Republicans chose to put him on the Small Business Committee. In this country, you're innocent until proven guilty, so mm -hmm. we're going to uh, treat him like any other member and you know, keep an eye on it. Our thanks to Chief Washington Correspondent Jonathan Carl. New Zealand's Prime Minister, Hacinda Ardern, has announced she will resign. Speaking at her political party's retreat, she said she doesn't have the energy or inspiration to seek re-election. Ardern called the last five and a half years the most fulfilling of her life. She said there was no secret scandal behind her resignation. Her party will vote Sunday for a new party leader and new prime minister. Back here at home to Keenan Anderson. He was a 31-year-old teacher visiting Los Angeles when he was stopped by an LAPD motorcycle officer and was accused of trying to steal a car and then ran away, police say. He was tased by officers and died hours later. Now there are growing demands for answers over his death. Earlier this evening, we spoke with his cousin and Black Lives Matter co-founder Patrice, Patricia uh, Cullors on how she is and how her family are pulling through. It's a lot. Um, today, I feel particularly uh, weepy. I'm not sure why, maybe because I have a stress cold from doing a lot of work this week, but um, it's exhausting to think that for a decade, many of us have been doing this work, and now it's on, at my own doorstep. Um, and I feel like it's surreal still, um, because I'm not just grieving, my whole family is. And we're all trying to make sense of this moment. A really touching interview with Patrice. Well, a mother claims, a woman claims, her trip to the salon for a manicure resulted in her developing a rare form of nail cancer. ABC Stephanie Ramos spoke to the mother of three who says it all started with a cut on her cuticle that didn't heal for months. It seemed harmless until it wasn't. Grace Garcia got her nails done faithfully for more than 20 years. But in 2021, in what she says happened during a pre-Thanksgiving day of pampering, left her in complete shock. As the technician was cutting my cuticle, she cut me. It was a deep cut, and I remember being very upset about it. Garcia says after a few days, she thought the cut on her ring finger was healing. But still, something seemed off. It felt as if um, I couldn't 
bump my finger into anything. I couldn't use it. I couldn't type well. It felt tender to the touch. After dealing with the pain for months and multiple follow-ups with her general doctor, in April of 2022, she was referred to a UCLA health specialist and dermatologist, Dr. Teo Soleimani, for a biopsy. And it came back as a squamous cell carcinoma, which is a, a very common form of skin cancer. But interestingly, when she was referred to me and I saw her finger, she didn't have any of the traditional uh, signs. Hers was HPV driven. And um, it's, an, it's an interesting thing to see. Human papillomavirus is commonly considered a sexually transmitted infection that can be transmitted through skin to skin contact or skin to mucosa contact. Depending on the strain, it can cause cancers or manifest as warts on various parts of the body. But in very rare cases, contaminated equipment has been considered a possible means of transmission for the disease. Grace had a very obvious injury that allowed a portal of entry for the high risk strain to kind of get in there. The reason we don't see it in places like, you know, our hands or our face or anywhere where we have thick skin is generally our skin has a top layer that's pretty protective. While HPV vaccination can prevent more than 90% of cancers caused by HPV from ever developing, prior to her diagnosis, Grace was not vaccinated. I think everybody should be vaccinated because it's one of the few simple ways that we can reduce cancer. All right, thanks to Stephanie Ramos for that. And still to come here tonight, the major fears from scientists after the research shows one country is hotter than any time in the past thousand years. And many pet owners think they know what their animals are thinking, but a select few might actually tell you the communication method behind these furry social media sensations. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Ready for a good show? I'm Phil Grucci of Fireworks by Grucci. No matter how big, no matter how small, it is dangerous. It's not a paycheck, it's our life. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. And we're tracking several headlines around the world this evening. Mexican authorities found 250 migrants traveling inside a tractor trailer. Authorities said migrants received food, water, legal advice, medical and psychological care before being put under the custody of the National Migration Institute. The man driving the tractor trailer was detained and handed over to federal authorities. This is bad news for Greenland and all of us. That's what scientists are saying about new research out today showing Greenland is hotter than at any time in the past 1,000 years. Scientists blame 
human-caused climate change. And they worry as Greenland's ice continues to melt, it will drive sea level rise across the globe. And Lionel Messi has been immortalized in Argentina in tattoos and mur murals after he helped Argentina win the World Cup. Now, his face can literally be seen from the sky. That that you were looking at, that is a huge cornfield that shows his face. That is incredible. Well, most pet owners would likely tell you that their cats or dogs communicate with them in a variety of ways. But now there are some button pushing felines and canines making their feelings crystal clear and becoming social media sensations along the way. Our Trevor Alt shows us how. Here in this idyllic Connecticut home, Steve B is about to address his kingdom. He's a so-called talking cat, pressing speech buttons with his paws to seemingly communicate his needs. What do you think? Tell us something. Oh, oh okay. there we go. OK, well, that was a few things. Yeah, but... that didn't make any sense, yeah. but all right. <laughs> it's like there, if you... Oh, I mean, that would have. Yeah, snuggle. Snuggle makes sense snuggle. for that one. That adorable face and button-pushing talent has made him an internet sensation. More than 240,000 followers on his TikTok, managed by his owner, Christina Wilson. And Steve isn't the only pet speaking his mind. Yes, at all. The button phenomenon has taken over social media as pet parents across the globe ask the age-old question, if my pet could talk, what would they say? Oh, Owners are turning to these programmable buttons, which allow them to choose phrases and words for their animal to interact with. Stranger. Stranger. <laughs> You're right. It's the latest phase in the recent fervor of pet ownership. In 2020, the pet industry exceeded $100 billion for the first time ever, with pet adoption increasing 250%. And the fitting face of that world is Steve B. Steve is actually named after Steve Buscemi, the actor. Oh, right. Because when Steve was born, he uh, had a upper respiratory infection, and his eyes were really inflamed, and, sure. and he looked just like Steve Buscemi. So. Naturally. Wilson is no stranger to cats. In fact, she has 10 of them, but she says Steve was always special. I had Steve from, I think he was two or three days old. As soon as his eyes opened and he was kind of aware, it was very obvious he was a different kind of dude. But he was just super social and really curious about everything and and just really like a different kind of intelligence than, than I've seen in any of our other animals. <laughs> I had seen these AAC buttons, so I thought, hey, you know, I think Steve would like this. Let's let's try. Wilson works as a cat behaviorist. She says a natural launching point to get Steve using the buttons was his unquenchable desire to go outside. Whenever I'd let him out, I'd push the button. And then he learned within four days it connected. And I could see the moment it connected where he's like, oh, because he used to just go to the door and scream. So then he just learned he could push the button and we'd open it and let him out. Okay. No, we just went outside. Uh, you Hi. And after that, all the rest of the buttons came super quick. If I wanted him to do something crazy and he didn't want to do it, he just wouldn't do it. That's the beauty of cats is, is they're not socialized in the way that dogs are. Yeah. That, exactly. Cats are just like, they're going to do what they want. Dogs have owners, cats have staff. Yes. Bunny is a three-year-old sheep -a doodle She's one of those dog social media sensations. Her owner, Alexis Devine, has been teaching Bunny how to use buttons since she brought her home. Every time we went outside, I would press the button, which would say outside. Then I would say outside, we would go outside. So she's hearing it a lot. And Bunny was standing over by the door, by her button. And out of the corner of my eye, I could see her looking down at the button and looking up at us. And then she like lifted her paw and looked at us and smashed the button. And I screamed. I was like, oh my God. And so we went outside and we had a little outside party and it was sort of game on. With more than 8 million TikTok followers, Bunny stands as one of the most followed animals on the app, with hundreds of thousands of views on every post. Hi, girly. What now? Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> Come here then. And I think this, the idea of like a dog translating collar or, you know, the movie Up. My master made me this collar so that I may talk, squirrel. I, I think that's been around in popular culture for a long time. 
and uh, hasn't really been actualized. And now that it has been, people are like, this is incredible. I think people really want to understand the animals that they share their lives with. Outside. Bunny now has a hundred yes, buttons sir. and is part of a study looking at animal communication. These beings that we share our lives with have emotions and probably are, are just as conscious as we are. Fluent Pet is the company behind the button system Bunny uses and they're running the How They Can Talk study. We are putting together a scientific integrity review board that is able to review all of the work that we're doing and our practices and then when our data sets are published, people can go in and look at them for themselves and decide whether what it is that we have found is real or not. You want to play? But is your pet actually talking? Well, according to science, the answer isn't very straightforward. I think where the problem with these buttons break down is when you're using it to communicate more abstract terms. If you call their name, do they know that I am fluffy? Or do they simply know, when you say this word, I need to look at you, right? Does that simply mean, look at me? Dr. Andrea Tu is a veterinarian. She's been studying animal behavior for years. She believes these buttons can be used to better understand your pet, but they won't be answering any hard-hitting questions anytime soon. If your end goal is to improve the relationship between you and your animal, you've done it in a way that you are not compromising the animal's welfare, then in that sense, for a layman's purpose, why not? It's not speech or language acquisition, it's associative concept learning, right? So what you're learning to do or what Steve is learning to do is associate a specific concept like going outside with an action, which is pushing the button, right? So he's not learning the word outside means this. And in fact, I don't know what he thinks the button means. That's not a one-to-one -one translation. Steve B may not be talking per se, but he still is able to express opinions. What seems like a disdain for a certain type of music. It sounds like we're still though a pretty long way away from just having a flat out conversation with our kids. Yes, absolutely. Yes. I think it's really entertaining. I think it's a great way to spend time with your pets. I really just caution that we don't take it too far into saying that we're speaking with our pets because that's not what we're, right. what's happening. So Steve B may not be sitting down with us for a full interview anytime soon, but Wilson says even with his massive fan club and limited vocabulary, the two of them have only grown closer. There's yeah. not going to be some high profile breakup between you and Steve? N Creative absolutely differences. not. Oh my gosh, I would be heartbroken. I don't Simon know, I don't know what I would do. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's my best friend. <laughs> I love that people love Steve. Um, right. That's all that I care about is that other people love my best buddy. We've come a long way from asking Lassie, what is it? What is it, girl? Our thanks to Trevor, and here's to hoping he gets that interview with Steve. And still to come here tonight, from struggling to get business to selling out just hours later, how a social media star helped a restaurant turn things around. Grammy-winning artist Megan Thee Stallion. Megan was the victim of a crime. The woman was shot, wound up in the hospital. Rapper accused of shooting Megan Thee Stallion. Tory Lanez is accused of shooting her after a night out. Megan Thee Stallion and the trial of Tory Lanez. There were times that she wished that he had just killed her so she wouldn't have to have gone through what she went through in the last two years. This is Impact by Nightline. Stay strong, Megan. Thank you. Meg, how do you feel? Now streaming only on Hulu. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. He may not look like central casting for a movie star hero, but what he did and how he risked it all to save hundreds of lives from terror are what heroes are made of. Really? That guy? What's the life and death truth behind what he did? Truth and Lies, The Informant. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Terrytown, New York, I'm Rob Marciano.
Wherever the weather is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Finally here tonight, a struggling pizza shop in Las Vegas gets an unexpected boost in business thanks to a feature from a popular TikTok food critic who gave the restaurant a glowing review. Reporter Alyssa Bethencourt from our partner station KTNV shows us how one social media video made all the difference to a small business owner. Frankenson's restaurant is getting some major shine, and it's all thanks to this video posted on TikTok. This is one of the best wings I've ever had. This is a 10. That's local food critic Keith Lee Just reviewing some you. of the best bites created by owner Frank Steele. Steele opened his shop four months ago and says business wasn't exactly off to a good start. But on Monday night, a miracle. I had this guy come in, didn't know who he was. And I like to ask my customers, you know, where you're from, what do you do? And he quietly said, I'm a food critic. Frank says he didn't think much like of it says. until a few hours later when business got busy. Our phone never stopped ringing. I sold more lemon pepper wings in the last two days than I have in the last four months. I made more garlic knots yesterday than I've ever made. Lee's review on TikTok captured the attention of people it. all over the world. Boy. And reflects the power of social media. One person writing in, I hope Frank gets all the business he deserves. Another saying, I don't know why this made me emotional. I want to meet and support Frank now. And this comment reads, wish I was in Vegas. Frank, your food looks fire. I have people coming in from Iowa, people from California. I had a family come up from Lake Havasu. I had people come down from Utah. The video has now been viewed more than 18 million times and liked by more than 4 million people. For Frank, all of it is still setting in. Could you have ever anticipated Monday morning what you were going to wake up to the next day and what these last 72 hours have been like? It's just been overwhelming. It's been a blessing. This restaurant has been a dream of mine for 30 years. For 30 years. Oh, what an incredible story, and congratulations to Frank. That is our show for tonight. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Janae Norman, and for Lindsay Davis, thank you for streaming with us.